We're back here with the Irish Canna Clinic series of talks, which is for Chris Allen is the Chief Executive of Hemp Federation of Ireland. So yeah, I watched the thing today of your 2020 uh, call uh, with the, um, it was in Trinity College, it was a conference. So have things moved on, Chris? Um, not really. So what we were discussing was the, the fact that, that, you know, we were at a seminal moment then in 2020 with yeah. the, um, the Irish hemp industry and the future of the Irish hemp industry. And in reality, Ireland should be leading the world in the development of this industry. Although our industry is small, it was highly um, functioning and we have also got some of the foremost experts in hemp farming, processing and downstream um, distribution, all of those aspects of hemp were developed over the past 50 years in Ireland and were really, really very good, which is what I found whenever I came into um, the industry in 2018. And the first thing that I did in 2018 was, was send a, a very small document um, to government um, and it was a response to the IPCC 2018 report on keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. And what became clear when, when you saw the substance of that 2018 report was that a moment had arrived where, where the hemp plant, so hemp is a member of the cannabis family, but it has so tiny an amount of um, the psychoactive substance that would be found in cannabis at very high levels. But hemp has, has that at a tiny, tiny minuscule trace amount, and it's an agricultural crop. So here we had a context now set by the IPCC, um, where hemp and industrial hemp farming and products were going to have a new relevance in terms of global development going forward following can, that. Can I just ask you to, uh, a lot of people really don't understand, a lot of uh, people that will watch this, is the, di the, cl the clinical differences between hemp and cannabis. So the, the hemp is the same plant, cannabis yeah. SSL, and uh, so the hemp in particular has low levels of, such low levels of that it's non-psychoactive of THC. Because the THC is the problem or not the problem. <laughs> exactly. So. So the THC in, in hemp is present at, um, so the, the legal difference between hemp and cannabis is based on the THC content of industrial hemp. My, so for, for in all of recent history, that content was 0.2% THC. Set, set, by, set by the EU? Or by, set by the European Ireland. Commission. Right. And I, so that is 0 0.2 of 1%. Like it's so minuscule that it's, um, it's you know, it's, it, it's not even really there. And I, so this was, was part of why the European Commission reintroduced him in Europe in 1970. And it was in order to develop the, the various different potentials of the crop. So it's got incredible potentials as a fiber um, plant. It also has incredible potentials as a seed producer. So the seed has... Um, there you go. So that's just another little uh, question I want to put to you. So, so the, the, the flowers, the, the differentiation between flowers and stalks and stems and all and the, all the other elements. So that's important in the in this case in the legal the legalization or illegalization of, of hemp. Well, you know, um, the <laughs> well, the hemp crop is the hemp crop, and in order for us to actually realize the environmental potentials of hemp. What we need to do is to ensure that farmers continue to be able to valorize all parts of the plant. So we need to take a whole plant approach to the development of the hemp sector. And a whole plant approach has to mean all use potentials in all circumstances for farmers. Um, what we saw happening was that as the, the kind of medicinal cannabis industry takes off, um, the CBD market for hemp 
products, which are food supplements, um, becomes important then for, for pharmaceutical actors. Um, so for a number of strategic reasons, controlling hemp is important uh, to more corporate uh, um, facing kind of cannabis industry actors for, you know, if there's much less red tape if you're growing hemp. Hemp has a huge amount of CBD content, while it has a tiny, tiny amount of, of THC. And also then you have a kind of disparate development of hemp around the world. So what you see is in, let's say, the more advanced um, cannabis markets like the US and, say, Canada, um, you see really an on-streaming of hemp and all use potentials of hemp coming with or just before um, the cannabis markets open up. So re in reality, whereas Europe has a 50-year-old agricultural hemp industry, the, the more advanced markets didn't have that history of hemp production. And so you have everything coming on stream more or less at the same time in those markets. So there isn't really a distinction happening in the way that it should between hemp and, and you know, cannabis for medicinal and adult use purposes. And so very much you get a corporate facing development of those markets. And what we have in Europe then is a completely different scenario. So we have the European market for, for medicinal and adult use um, cannabis products opening up. And in that context, you have a hemp industry, an agricultural industry that has existed in Europe for more than 50 years. Now, the fact that that exists here implies legal rights and entitlements for European hemp farmers and industry operators. And that presents a problem for more co corporate facing, um, you know, cannabis actors. Um, so the big corporate entities, um, because their position in the European market needs to be maintained in order to continue that perspective, that development perspective that we see in Canada and the US um, within the, the rollout of the European industry. And obviously, if, if the corporate facing development of cannabis markets in Europe um, continues, then that will really decide the way in which the global industry gets developed going forward. So what we have in Europe is that um, under Article 28 of the 1961 Single Convention, um, the European um, Commission introduces hemp within that context because hemp for industrial and horticultural purposes is exempt uh, from the provisions of the 1961 Single Convention under Article 28. And what that allows the European Commission to do is to give um, European farmers an opportunity to develop the various different potentials of the crop. So, you know, you can make um, really, really incredible products from industrial hemp. You can make, um, you know, carbon negative, carbon neutral um, building yeah. materials, for example, from the fibre. And they are equally durable and equally efficient. Um, with uh, the current um, very um, dirty CO2 in heavy industries that, you know, so concrete and, and building supplies, you know, fiberglass, all of those things. So hemp, hemp can replace all of those with fiber. The seed is the most complete source of plant-based protein known to man. That's incredibly important in the context of the environment and of climate change. And then you have the, the CBD flowers. So they can they create um, nutraceutical foods. And so under Article 28 of the 1961 Single Convention, the European Commission introduces the crop back to Europe. And the objective of the, the agricultural policy behind that introduction is to innovate, 
to find where we can start using this crop um, again. And in that context, about 10 European member states consistently grow the crop over those 50 years. And Ireland is one of those. Wow. Yeah. yeah. We won't know that, you know? We won't know that. So yeah. For, for five decades, we've had an industry. Yeah. Wow. We have. And uh, so Ireland is one of those member states. However, Europe is a, a, a conglomerate. Can I ask of, just about the, the viability of, uh, like, for farmers, is the viability in the, in the hemp-derived oils or is it the is it in the kind of industrial use of the the fabrics the 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 all the other is it the industrial use or the uh, the pharmacological uh, uses which is where is the the real viability lie for for farmers and business and in industry okay so so the viability lies in the whole plant potentials okay so this is the point that hemp federation ireland was making in our 20 18 um, submission to, to Irish policymakers um, in the context of the IPCC report. Because what you see happening now is you have a market for industrial hemp in Europe uh, and globally. And that market has been advancing and increasing exponentially since around about 2016. And the main economic driver of that market expansion is the production of CBD food supplements and CBD for use in cosmetics and uh, food and feed, uh, etc. And so you, you, you have that rapid expansion. Then what you have as well, and this is the point that we were making to Irish policymakers in 2018, that you have as a result of the IPCC 2018 report, you're going to see a repositioning of a completely innovative approach now to agriculture, agricultural production um, throughout the world to come in line with what we need to do in order to get to net zero by 2050. Okay, and to do what we need to do to keep global warming um, below a uh, certain level. The reason, the reason being the, the sequestering abilities of the plant. No? For, to, well, for that's, that's one of the aspects of it. So, so hemp over it, um, you know, will, will sequester more CO2 than a forest or any other commercial crop. But it only takes, you know, um, around about three months to grow from seed to maturity. So you're sequestering all that carbon in the crop. And, uh, but then on top of that, hemp doesn't need any um, agrochemicals or, um, you know, pesticides, uh, et cetera, to grow perfectly well. It grows exceptionally well in Ireland. Um, oh, yeah. And then because of the way the, the, the root system in hemp works, it's got a very, very deep root system. Um, so it, it it kind of aerates the soil. It prevents soil erosion. It will um, nurture the soil. So hemp will increase soil fertility to a huge extent. And if you use hemp as a break crop, for example, you will get between ten and thirty percent uh, increased yield in your follow-on crop. Um, and that's purely because of the benefits that hemp is bringing to your soil uh, in terms of soil health. And then on top of that, you've got um, all of these downstream products that you can make from hemp, um, which are carbon negative, carbon neutral, and will replace fossil carbon uh, materials for industry. And also on top of that, then you've got uh, the fact that you can eat it. Okay. so. <laughs> You know, in in terms of of climate change, and is it a kind of it's an animal feed as well? Oh God, yeah, because I mean, animals have an endocannabinoid system as well, <laughs> so all mammals do, and so yeah, hemp is is a, a feed for. It's an effective feed for because all the inputs we constantly talk about the inputs into uh, into meat 
for instance, and Ireland is a very is still a very meat driven e e economy, and mm -hmm. uh, so hemp can provide an awful lot of those inputs. Totally. And so as well as that, then you're offsetting kind of, you know, soy and other yeah. kinds of proteins that are also problematic in terms of environmental um, integrity. Um, so because hemp has, again, in the seed that um, most complete source of plant based protein known to man. So it has all of your essential amino acids, the amino acids that your body can't make itself. And it has omegas three and six in optimum bioavailable ratio. So there's an awful lot of foods that would have these things, but but they don't have them in a way that your body can absor absorb them easily. But hemp yeah. has them in a way that that is easily absorbed by your body. And so therefore if they, the benefits are are manifold. It's it's just an an incredible crop all around. So to go back to your question, um whenever so the CBD industry becomes the, the kind of driving force um, for the economic kind of kickstart for the hemp sector. And then you, you kind of, that dovetails with the climate crisis. And so within the 2018 uh, IPCC report, they give you a number of pathways, okay? So these are ways in which we get from where we are now to where we need to be to achieve climate neutrality um, by 2050 and keep global warming um, at manageable levels. And some of those pathways have no overshoot. So it means that they will give you what you want without creating lots of other problems for you along the way. So what is at the base of all those those most um prolific pathways is uh, agricultural um food production with low energy inputs and a uh, high protein so you're looking for a high protein low energy crops and then hemp also uh, in relation to that then uses very little water it it's so drought resistant um, and it grows in oh, other temperatures. Yeah. I mean, it's just incredible. When I came into this initially, um, I was hired to do a piece of research, um, which then became that 2018 uh, submission. And I, at that point, knew almost nothing about industrial hemp. And as I did that piece of research, honestly, I was... It was just incredible. And it was like, how can we not know this? Yes. It's so important. And uh, so now what we have is, right, so, so we have the 2018 IPCC report. And then what we have is the European Commission takes its regulation called LULU-CF, so Land Use, Land Use Change and Forestry. And it completely refurbishes that piece of EU regulation. And what it does is it combines agricultural practice and production, the CAP, so EU agricultural food production, sure. with climate policy objectives, okay, and green industry policy. And it amalgamates them all in this incredible piece of, of uh, regulation and so then in 2021 the European Commission launches what's called the the European Sustainable Carbon Cycles Framework and what that does is it, it sets sets this this policy dynamic in motion and so between now and 2030 what will happen is all of those different policies, so green industry policy, and that's, you know, moving away from, from fossil carbons and towards um, biomass, such as hemp, which can create the replacement materials. Um, it's the, the farm to fork, the cap, and the climate policy objectives. They're all going to merge gradually 
from now until 2030. And then post 2030, what you'll have is um, they will start kind of, so if you think of them kind of merging, then that becomes a kind of like a cyclone after 2030 to get us to carbon neutrality by 2050. So you, you have a position in, in the on these EU hemp kind of boards or um, like, I mean, you're an active member of a couple of them, no? Within the I, yeah, we participate. Uh, yeah, we do. So, for example, and this is an important one. Um, last um, June, Hemp Federation Ireland presented our, our latest research uh, um, in Brussels. And what what we did was we situated hemp in the context of that sustainable carbon cycles framework. And we looked at what the various different potentials are in that context and what the European Commission needs to do to ensure that those potentials can be fully realized um, along the way towards uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. And the most obvious thing that, that we, we urged um, should happen would be that um, hemp products or products made from hemp would be treated in um, carbon counting practices at Europe in the same way as harvested wood products are treated. So for example, if you're a forester and you harvest your wood, then if your wood is used to make the frame for a house or, or a table or, you know, for those yeah. kinds of products, then you, you, you've got carbon credits coming to you for that. Now, there's no tradition um, of counting agricultural crops um, in that way. But the at the end of June, I think it was then the European Commission uh, had its internal meeting on um, the hemp and flax. Uh, sector and at that point the commission um, said that it was positively um, considering that recommendation so that hemp would be included um, hemp products finished products in the same way as harvested wood products are, are included in carbon budgets and that's huge that's massive now the European Commission did put that proposal um, to the member states, MEPs said um, that they what they did was they removed it from the final legislation. But they, what they requested was that the European Commission would would provide reports for them in relation to these products. So it didn't end up in the legislation, but it's not off the table. And once that comes into play, that's going to be a game changer for the global hemp industry. It's going to be a game changer for farmers um, of hemp. And, you know, the, the kind of importance of, of carbon credits and carbon counting, I don't think anybody is, I'm, you know, most people understand the importance of that now going forward. But what you've got then is, is a potential for, for the hemp crop, which is already one of the most lucrative crops uh, for European farmers to grow, if they can use all parts of it, um, that they you, can you, have this. That Europe, Europe, Europe on the whole is like when you say it's the most lucrative crop with, within Europe. Is that like taking the twenty-seven countries together, or um, what? Who are that? Who well, that for mean? for individual farmers, right. it is one of the most lucrative crops you can grow. Um, so we have a tradition in Ireland where that Article 28 of the, the UN Single Convention and what was allowed when, when the Commission reintroduced the hemp crop. We have a tradition in Ireland of our regulators taking full advantage of absolutely everything that was permitted under that. So encouraging every single aspect of the industry, encouraging the development of all of these products so, for example, we have, um, you know, some of the most um, highly regarded hemp foods made from the green parts of the plant. So these would be um, raw foods, but they would be 
nutraceutical foods. So they will contain all of your CBD and all of your other um, phytocannabinoids mm. and other nutrients in the green parts of the plant, but they're not extracted products. These are just raw food products. And these were developed in Ireland. These were first introduced to the world uh, stage in Ireland. They were, um, you know, with the encouragement of Irish regulators. So, um, you know, Ireland has that tradition. We have that um, regulatory approach historically from our regulators and our farmers were encouraged to do all of this as were our processors. Is that reflected in our voice at the EU table? Like the, the general EU kind of see Ireland as having a significant voice in, the, in, uh, in hemp legislation or consideration? Well, I think that the European Commission acknowledges that um, we have a very old, long-established hemp industry in Ireland and acknowledges that, that there would be rights and entitlements um, accruing as a result. What the issue, I suppose, from Ireland is that in 2018, you have very suddenly Irish authorities start describing the agricultural hemp crop as a dangerous drug. And they do that in a number of ways. So it's done in public discourse, public narratives, but it's all also being done in a performative way. Um, so we have the, the guards and the drug squad arriving at people's businesses and at people's homes and performing these drug style raids on shops and, and on people's homes. Well, most it, tends people, be, it, tends be, it tends to be small businesses that they're, that they're targeting. I mean, uh, you have the bigger businesses that exist in supermarkets in Tesco and uh, what's the big one called? Holland and Barrett or whatever it's called. They seem to be able to freely sell their products. And exactly. then you have, you have the likes of Little Collins and these other kind of individual businesses getting, you know, like you're saying, having to endure this uh, persecution. Okay. Exactly. And, and that's, that's the issue. So what, what you see happening from what most people don't understand is that the, the businesses who, who are targeted in 2018, so these people have gone to the, the guards, they have gone to the HBRA, they have gone to the FSAI, and they have been told that these products are legal agricultural products and that that's fine. And then without any consultation whatsoever with Irish hemp farmers and industry operators, all of a sudden one day, these drugs raids start happening. And- At the instigation of who? Of the just Irish Justice Department or, I mean, who, who's taking responsibility for that? I mean, we're, we're, we're bound by EU law. The EU is the, <laughs> highest, is the highest law in the land, apparently. And so- yeah. Are we, are we acting illegally as a country in, in raiding these small individual businesses? It, it, it... What we're, we're acting, you know, in contravention of a number of EU laws. Yeah. Um, so it appears to, to come principally from the, the Department of Health, um, this, this new approach to hemp. And so... What you have then is this consistent representation of him uh, in public discourse as, you know, in some sense criminal, um, as a dangerous drug. You have the Department of Health and the Department of Agriculture um, claiming that uh, there are licenses that people need to have in order to, um, you know, have hemp in their possession etc. Um, when in reality, those licenses don't exist. There are no such licenses. <laughs> but <clears throat> the, I suppose what, what people should understand is this, that at European level, agricultural regulations are made centrally between the European authorities and the member state authorities. Okay, so this is a unified lawmaking process for agricultural production throughout Europe. And 
the Department of Agriculture participates on behalf of Ireland in defining and establishing those laws. Once established, those laws are immediately applicable across member states, and there is no um, there's no exception to those laws. They're immediately and applicable. You know, rules are binding. So then you have, let's say, consumer law in Europe. So if you take, for example, a food product, okay, food law is also an overarching EU law. However, when it comes to when it comes to consumer goods, the European Commission allows member states a little bit of leeway. So where they can maybe introduce measures if those measures are, for example, to protect human health, if there's an issue somewhere. Okay, but those interventions have to be supported by science. Okay, you can't just decide that you're going to interfere in the, the operation of the European single market um, off your own bat. So what we see happened in Ireland was this, that the Minister for Agriculture in 2019 said that the Minister for Health was now in charge of the agricultural hemp sector. The Minister for Health then starts representing hemp as a drug. Um, then in 2020, we have the European Court of Justice ruling that says member states can't, you're not allowed to um, regulate industrial hemp as a drug. Why? Because there's no evidence to show that hemp and derived products pose a threat of any kind to human health. So no, you can't do that. So a few weeks after that Court of Justice ruling was released, Minister Donnelly designates hemp as a dangerous drug in Irish law, okay, under the Misuse of Drugs Act. So obviously ministers for health can't simply decide that EU agricultural crops and goods are now dangerous drugs. There has to be the science. He has to produce the science. Minister Donnelly has been unable to produce any science whatsoever to show that there is a risk to human health posed by industrial hemp and derived goods. And the reason for that is because there is no such scientific evidence. It just doesn't exist. Because it's horrible. It's horrible, to be honest, Chris, that this is an ongoing uh, thing all the time. And, you know, we... Uh, we can't preach to to the, the it's not preaching to the choir, you know. But we really need. I think the Germans. What do you think? The Germany are going to dig down into this to uh, and get a scientific uh, thing over the line within the EU. That's that would be a great hope, and I feel I certainly share that. I mean, <laughs> the, the European industry is is in flux at the moment. It's yeah. it's um you know it's. You've got, I mean, DG Agri and the European Commission in general has moved so far towards this crop and and products, you know, to support it. Um, it seems that the member states then are are kind of all in a tizzy and and they're doing one thing this day and another thing the next day. But Ireland is is really exceptional in in terms of European member states because. You know, Ireland really hasn't even made a pretense of um, democracy in relation to the, its governance of the hemp industry. So, for example, you've got um, farmers who have absolutely no idea of what the economic value of this crop is. There's very little conversation. There's, there's, I mean, in all reality there's no meaningful conversation in Ireland around the environmental benefits of industrial I mean and and that's criminal it really is because they're so extensive and so what's happened is that from 2018 up until the present day every time industrial hemp gets mentioned somebody on the state side will come in and start talking about drugs 
and start talking about illegal drugs and start talking about medicinal cannabis. And so you never get to have a conversation in Ireland about the, the environmental potential. And all the uses. <clears throat> and all the uses. And the farmers, you know, have no idea of what the actual uses are. Like you see now an awful lot of interest. So following... Hemp Federation Ireland's presentation last year in Brussels. So that was the one where we situate the, the competencies of the crop in the carbon cycles framework. And that there, that framework is so highly monetized. I mean, there's so much money being pumped into this uh, from Europe. But what you see now is, is an interest from the global corporate sector. Um, looking at this, this aspect, so the carbon credit aspect of industrial hemp, but still <laughs> there's no conversation with Irish farmers. And what you have to as well, I think, understand in that context is that last year, the Climate Change Advisory Council, so the Irish Climate Change Advisory Council and Board Bia, both of them, um, advised Irish policymakers that in the next 10 years, within a decade, that um, global food supply chains will be dominated, dominated by um, consumer demand for three food products. And they are high protein vegetable food production. So we take that box. More than any other plant. Um, nutraceutical foods. Take that box. CBD is probably, you know, the most um, sought after um, emerging nutraceutical food on the planet. Um, yeah. So we take that box. And the third category is... Um, That's a constant expanding world that can phytocannabinoids is, an, uh, is constantly expanding with science. Exactly. And then the third group is um, sustainably produced speciality foods. So hemp also takes that box because, um, so for example, uh, say, you know, say for example, take whey protein. So that would be used by athletes and by, you know, bodybuilders, bodybuilders and, and people in, you know, going to the gym and all of that sort of thing. Sure. And you're, so that's currently it's a made huge industry. Well. That's a huge industry on its own. Massive. These are all micro industries. It feels like we're talking about. So each one of these is like you can departmentalize it as a kind of micro industry, and they all can can come from this this magical plant. But it is Absolutely. really a real plant. Exactly, and uh, so so you. This is where you you see the the need for fully integrated development of the hemp sector. So you have to take into account all of these various different potentials, and then you have to integrate them. And in order to, to kind of manifest the IPCC pathways that have the highest co-benefits, including for human health, in order to manifest them, what you have to do is you have to integrate everything at local level. Okay. So it's you're looking at at starting a tiny, tiny um, spot of land, maybe your farm or whatever, and then you move. That's moving out, moving out, and moving out to a global level where all of these micro harmonizations at local level come together at a global scale to um, manu manifest. Um, the complete kind of change in industrial practice in agricultural food production, in land use, in forestry, in, in all of the areas where we need to um, make adjustments in order to, to tackle climate change. We're, move, we're moving towards an area that I really wanted to get uh, hear from you on was, uh, is this thing about the processing. 
And because uh, what I know, but I've, I'm, I'm here in Spain and I've been to a couple of uh, uh, conferences and different things. And uh, I was at a kind of a pitch like for, for a, a venture capital pitch by uh, there's an in, there's a university in Barcelona that has a devoted uh, cannabis, uh, cannabis plant, hemp, all the derivatives of the of the plant. And it's uh, and it's it's in an academic setting, and it's wonderful. It's a complete university devoted to devoted to the canvas, the plant. So there, within that, there was uh, several like presentations made. These guys pitching for uh, pitching for VC, uh, and uh, they were talking about the the processing and how and they were describing how that the, the, there is no processor in Spain, which I was totally shocked about because Spain has an old industry here of uh, hemp and cannabis and everything for so long, and they don't have a processing. Whereas then they were saying that there's nine processors in France. France is a big kind of developed a developed market. And then, but then what it said to me, what it kept on, it's what it seemed to me, it kept on saying that the Irish market will be very small if this is such a complicated thing to produce, uh, produce this level of processing required for hemp. So I'd love you to say just a little bit about that. And uh, is Ireland, uh, is Ar has Ireland processing? Does it, can it have processing? Is it viable to have a processor in Ireland? If Spain can have one? Yeah, so I understand your question. Um, so, yeah, so we nearly got one. <laughs> we nearly got one. And I, I think it was the, you know, maybe the somewhere around the mid 2000s, maybe, or, or it's really? earlier than that. Um, so we had uh, one of our farmers up in, in Cavan. He started looking at uh, hemp for building materials, I think it was in the 1990s. And so he actually, he's one of our guys, he had his, um, um, a special process that he developed for creating hemp building materials. And, and he patented that in Europe in 2006, I think. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so Irish innovation. Exa the exactly, we're very good on, um, on hemp foods and we're very on construction. But um, so what what he did was he he got investment uh, between Northern Ireland and the South. And he was, I think, 5% of the capital remained to be um, put in and he couldn't get it. He just couldn't get it because there were kind of various agencies and various actors who just didn't understand, I suppose, that uh, so hemp, I suppose, has already always existed in a some sort of a grey area in people's minds. If you don't understand that, you think maybe it's something to do with cannabis. But anyway, we, we nearly got one up in Limavady, but but that didn't happen. Um, but so it's you're talking about economies of scale. Uh, yeah. Ireland can certainly, certainly. Um, support a fiber industry and um, there aren't any processing um, so industrial scale processing uh, plants but what you've got to set that against is that so five acres of hemp will build uh, an average three-bedroom house um, so you scale that up you know um, yeah. it's not an awful lot of, of acres it's a small number of acres to build a house. So you could build several houses, but you need to be able to process the fiber. That's the thing. Uh, yeah, so so uh, we have, for example, um, people who, who have currently got an incredible innovation in um, um, hemp modular building. So in, you'd be taking out, let's say the wood component of the structure of the house, and yeah. we'll be uh, using a kind of new composite material to make that end of the, the construction. And then you'd be wrapping that in your hemp um, and using hemp blocks and stuff like that. And then you use your hemp fiber insulation and then you use, you know, your hemp lime rendering. And it's just a, a question of getting people to a point where they understand enough to understand what they're investing in. And we're, we are getting there. Um, I'm getting the regulation of the industry in Ireland to a point where 
it's no longer, um, you know, mm. too risky for yeah. people to commit to that um, investment. I mean, we have... It was quite, quite sizable. The, the, the presentations that I've seen, the, the kind of investment that they were looking from, from these VCs, it was very yeah. sizable. Yeah, well, Spain is an awful lot bigger. I mean, of course, and, yeah. And, you know, Spain yeah. can definitely support that. Yeah. You know, for, for multiple things. And I think that what's important for everybody to understand when they're looking at those kinds of developments with them is that the European um, Carbon Cycles Framework, it works a bit like a bioeconomy, circular bioeconomy thing. So you have a hierarchy of needs, you have cascade of uses. So at the very tip top of that, that um, carbon cycles framework is food production, okay? Because that's, that's where it's all at going forward in the context of climate change. How do we feed ourselves? And so food production is at the top. And then the next thing down is carbon fossil replacement materials for industry, okay? So there's multiple of those coming from, let's say, if you take the example of health. Hemp, there's multiple. I mean, we're talking about textiles, paper, building, uh, industrial plants, the whole thing. And then there's uh, the next level is energy production. So there's an issue here where there is a tension between the use of hemp fibers for these downstream uh, non-fossil carbon materials for industry and the energy companies who want to use the, fi the, the biomass for, for energy yeah. production, okay? Now, if you go into energy production, you don't get any of the, the carbon credits or, or those kinds of things. So, so your, 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 your harvested hemp is not actually earning any, um, you know, kudos, let's say. Uh, in the cred cred Credits have value. Credits have value. They have a, a huge value, huge monetary yeah. value, and that value is going to increase. And so, you know what? What you have currently in Ireland is is just a a terrible, terrible situation where the state so successfully criminalised the crop and so successfully um, created a fear of. Um, reputational damage um that that it became impossible to even represent the crop um with policymakers with with anybody um so underneath that narrative what you had was the state quietly dismantling the existing Irish hemp industry um so making it impossible to, to intentionally. trade intentionally and um, refusing, for example, to put in place proper um, regulations, proper controls and specifications for um, products coming into the Irish market. So we would have been very, very, very anxious that our supply chains would have been protected by and that Irish consumers of CBD products would have been protected um, by introducing proper science-based regulations in the Irish market. But the failure to do that, then you end up with, you know, crazy stuff coming in here and no regulations and, and no really overseeing. Huh? It's like the Wild West who left, well, left like, without, I mean, without regulation. Yeah, it's very sad. So, so we have, you know, this this happening underneath. So the the Irish hemp industry that has existed and developed over the last fifty years being being dismantled in the background, and then by twenty twenty, and this is why I was saying this kind of takes us back to the beginning. But um, the why we were at a seminal moment in twenty twenty in terms of the regulation of the hemp sector in Ireland was because by 2020, the state successfully transfers the entire revenue stream from the agricultural hemp sector into the control of pharmaceutical cannabis companies. So 
no longer in the control of Irish farmers, now in the hands of pharmaceutical companies. And once that happened, um, you know, then you see a number of other things really quickly starting to happen. So you have the, the Enterprise Ireland adopt a policy to say that only pharmaceutical companies can access any state enterprise support for any commercial activity related to any part of the European hemp crop in Ireland. Then you see the revenue commissioners banning um, the import and export of any hemp crop material or any product if it contains any amount of THC whatsoever. You have a rationale behind that saying that scientific equipment sensitive enough to ensure with 100% certainty that there is 0.00% THC in any hemp material is not available and therefore uh, we, can't, we can't know for certain that um, there is no THC in any part. Can't test. Can't no. test. Everything's illegal. Exactly. So then the Minister for Agriculture decides to ban all Irish hemp farmers and industry operators from accessing COVID-19 uh, supports. Um, so you have the industry being, being dismantled. It's handed over to, to corporate uh, cannabis actors. And then you have the, the kind of whole COVID-19, which I mean, we were talking earlier about the impacts COVID-19 has had on, on various different sectors. But, um, you know, at a point in time where, where, you know, the industry was really suffering, the Minister for Culture decides that he's not supporting it either. And he's not supporting Irish farmers and, and operators. Um, he then um, comes back at some point uh, later on in 2021 and says, oops, that was a mistake um, because we are supposed to in law support it. But, um, then what the Minister for Agriculture does is he, he introduces a consultation in Ireland on hemp. And that consultation is limited strictly to discussing the stock of the hemp plant. So we're not allowed to discuss any of the food products. We're not allowed to discuss anything other than the stock of the crop. So, of course, Hemp Federation Ireland, at that point, we, we did a six-page document to the Secretary General of the Department of Agriculture, pointing out that, you know, the, the economic driver of, of the hemp industry and, you know, of, of farm production in Europe is the food value of the crop, um, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it was a very comprehensive argument, but but what happened in the end was that the consultation went ahead. So we had another um, hemp farmers organization that supported the this stock only consultation. And so that consultation went ahead. And just before Christmas, the report on that consultation was released and um, indeed as a uh, Hemp Federation Ireland had advised the department, um, they found that there is no potential for an economically viable fibre only <laughs> industry in Ireland. And uh, so now we're left in a position where, um, well, what hemp industry could there possibly be now in Ireland? So we're not allowed to have anything other than a stock industry. The stock industry doesn't, isn't viable. So the only viable industry is the one that now is in the hands of pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical. Hands. And um, Irish hemp farmers, again, as I said, are just being given like no accurate information. Like, for example, we were we went to um, Chagas had a, a hemp event last year in yep. uh, April, I believe. And so that happened up in in Chagas in. Together with this hemp farmers group who had supported the the stock consultations and actually interestingly only two 
um, responses came to that consultation and one was from this farmers cooperative and the other one was from Chagas. So essentially the other one came from within the Department of Agriculture itself. So there really was only one respondent. But anyway, there, there was this, this hemp event up in Chagas and, you know, I mean, it was it was stunning. It was stunning um, what happened at that event. So, you know, you had farmers were being advised um, that you can make CBD out of seeds. I mean, I don't know if people understand this, but, but you know, in general, I know people involved in, in, in the industry will know. But, you know, CBD has to be made out of the flowers and leaves of the plant. You can't make CBD out of hemp seeds. So just to be very clear to all Irish farmers, that's not possible. Yeah. You have to use the flowers and leaves because that's where the cannabinoids are. Sure. Um, so you have the, the Irish state, you know, agricultural scientific research agency uh, hosting a conference um, is ostensibly introducing Irish farmers, you know, and to inform Irish farmers who might be interested in growing the crop that you can make CBD out of hemp seeds. Mm -hmm. You have uh, research um, being being introduced and that research, for example, one of the pieces of research um, finds that 547 hectares of industrial hemp could offset all emissions from Irish agriculture in a given year. Now, if you took away all of the houses, roads, and everything that exists on the island of Ireland and planted the entire landmass with hemp, you still wouldn't be sequestering enough carbon to offset all of the carbon emissions from Ireland. And the most bizarre thing about that was that this was being introduced by you know, Chagas, one of the authors of the 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 kind of so every country in Europe has a a mechanism for looking at the the carbon cost or the carbon benefit of um, a particular agricultural policy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you have these kind of tools for, for measuring these things. So the person who, who, who was writing the Irish version of that tool was introducing this research as a groundbreaking um, contribution to the field. Um, you know, it's so incredibly extraordinary that I, you know. And ultimately, uh, hugely <laughs> frustrating, Chris. You know, it's like it's uh, it's absurd to uh, keep meeting these barriers. I'm very conscious of uh, taking your time. It's it's absolutely fascinating to me. And uh, and I'm thank I want really want to be thanking you for your time. But uh, I know you've got things to do, busy lady. You're looking after a hell. You've got quite a a, a portfolio of stuff to look after. Yeah. So, uh, and just to wrap it, so uh, we're, this is an all island. I mean, the hemp doesn't decide where it grows in the sense that we're, we're on, it, it's a cross border uh, uh, situation and hemp grows on each, each side of the border in Ireland. And is that a massive factor? Is that complicating everything even more? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, so, like our farmers would have traditionally, um, so, for example, in the UK, it was never possible to to grow hemp for CBD. Right. Um, so things like that. But but in Ireland, our farmers could commission farmers from the north to grow the crop. And um, my understanding is that traditionally northern Irish authorities have been very supportive of the Irish hemp industry. And I, you know, there hasn't been a problem in in that that regard. But I think in in when you're looking at kind of climate, um, you you have to look at the 
the geological no, integrity of the island. I mean, if you've got a river flowing north to south, it doesn't know that it's crossing the border. It's sure. either clean water or it's not. And I, so you have to look at that um, integrity of the island as a, as a whole, I think, in order to get the best kind of out of your, your climate focused um, actions. But yeah, no, I think that, you know, there, there is a potential in Ireland for us to, to all sit down and start being honest and start being grown ups. And, you know, just there needs to be a cross governmental um, initiative for this. Um, we tried, I spent eight months trying to set up a, a, a hemp industry kind of um, forum um, and you know it was it was like we had just incredible people who would come in and I uh, so scientists and climate scientists um, and they would they would work under the forum so they would validate and verify uh, scientific information that was being presented to policymakers and various different government departments. Um, unfortunately, um, the, the various state agencies and departments, um, at the end of the day, then refused to support it. Um, but something like that is definitely, definitely needed because what's happening in Ireland is going to take Irish farmers out of this game um, for, for good because they'll be so far behind what's happening at European level and they're going to be locked into a development framework for this industry that is not in their interests either economically socially or in terms of them returning the kinds of environmental outcomes that the state is asking them to return uh, so I think that you know, it's very complex. The whole thing is complex and it's made more complex by the way in which the Irish state has, has confused everything further through its actions. So it becomes quite difficult to explain to people. I think, I think to people out there in the world, they kind of look, you know, when you look at a, a very, from a distance at this issue, people going, wow, look at our, what hemp does in terms of sequestering. Exactly. We have a we have a climate emergency. We have all of these things. We have all, and hemp is a mass can be a massive solution for this. In South Africa, I see they're building skyscrapers from hemp. You know, they, they had the first. I think it's ten tower, uh, ten floors high in, yeah. in South Africa, built from hemp. And so this is uh, it's po it's popping up all over the world. This reality of the the industrial uses of this plant, and yet we're stuck here. And there has to be a bunch of. Uh, I even hear sometimes about uh, fuel for airlines. You know, and all of the things that like we're only we're only scratching the surfaces in this conversation about the about these uses. And uh, I lived in in Brazil. For instance, where Brazil have, has sugar cane, and uh, the entire country is run run by uh, on biofuels, and uh, so hemp is obviously a massive uh, can be, have a massive player in this as well. So it is. I mean, what's your to to wrap up because I want to let you go. I mean, had you for uh, so you're you're fascinating. I think Ireland is, has to be very grateful that we have uh, such uh, such a knowledge at the at the at the top of our hemp federation and even though you're meeting all the barriers you're we need and we need knowledgeable people to kind of push back on it but you can't push back forever what could, what do you think is going to happen or where is it going to go in your short term well i don't know i mean again i think it all comes back to the the approach of the state and this drugs narrative um, and yeah. you know there's no basis in logic in law or in science for anything. nobody has ever died no, but I mean, these are this plant. Like CBD products of all kinds, including those that contain trace amounts of THC, are regulated as foods by the European Commission. They can't be dangerous drugs. <laughs> like, you know, European citizens are, you know, arguably the most protected food consumers in the world. 
I'd say they are. I'd you say know, and there. the European Commission does not regulate things as food if they're dangerous drugs. It, it, it just can't happen. So there's no legal basis for the Irish government to be saying that these things are, are drugs. What needs, so for example, the, the huge success of the approach of the Irish government in public, consistently describing the crop and products as drugs. Probably the, the greatest casualty of that is the failure of civil society environmental organizations. So environmental NGOs in Ireland, they're failing to take hold of this issue, understand what's happening and deal with the environmental aspects to protect the Irish environment. Um, you know, that's a monumental failure. It's a monumental failure. There are others. So, it, you know, this, this consistent drugs narrative has also had an impact on the functioning of the Houses of the Rocks because there is the same kind of reticence to engage. And that's getting much better now. That's getting much better. But then you have like this a profound confusion in the Irish court system, in the Irish justice system. Um, like over Christmas, Federation Ireland had to, I mean, I worked tirelessly throughout the Christmas holidays because you had a bizarre court of just, um, high court ruling in November in Ireland. And what that court decided was that these food products must be considered to cause the same um, detrimental uh, damage to human health as trafficked drugs. Um, like, and then to, to support that, the court uses the World Health Organization's um, research into um, the dangers of, of consuming trafficked drugs. Um, whereas the World Health Organization has repeatedly clarified that foods made from hemp, which contain below 0.2% THC, pose no threat whatsoever to human health. Um, but what happened on foot of that was that um, the Irish state then started to um, resume the prosecution of Irish citizens. So in the week before Christmas, I started to be contacted by, by people like members of the public, ordinary citizens, um, companies and uh, you know, who aren't necessarily members of Hemp Federation Ireland to say, oh my God, look, this is happening on the 9th of January. And this is Christmas week. And then you, you've got like the Christmas break in between. How are we supposed to deal with this? And so I spent the whole of Christmas um, engaging with the European Commission to try to prevent um, that high court ruling that happened in November in Ireland, which is so extensively problematic um, from being used as a precedent to, to put Irish citizens, so people who buy these foods, which are legal EU products in Ireland from, um, you know, the state is trying to put these people in prison. Irish farmers, for example, have been advised um, by that court ruling um, that if they continue to make these, these products themselves. So Irish farmers are no longer allowed to grow the crop um, to make these products, to make the products um, that they innovated and introduced to the world. They're no longer allowed to grow the crop to make those products. But the market in Ireland remains fully open uh, for business. Those products that used to be grown on Irish farms are now grown by farmers in other EU member states and imported into Ireland. Irish farmers have been advised that if they try to continue to make the products themselves, that they will be um, 
they should expect to have um, prison sentences of up to life imprisonment for trafficking in drugs. And what we are talking about is an EU regulated agricultural. It's uh, insane. It's insane, Chris. It's mad. But to, to end, all that needs to happen here is for somebody in Ireland to be brave, somebody be in a position of power, and say, we need to sort this out because. You know, the level of information, disinformation and, you know, extraordinary kind of duplicitousness that's happening here just just needs to stop. Yeah. We all need to, to come together and sit down and move forward in a rational, scientifically authorised, legal way to restore um, to Irish hemp farmers and industry operators the control over the industry that they built over the last 50 years. Chris, we'll leave it there. And uh, because you are, you are extraordinary, and I, but I really, the, 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 the thing that I get the most out of this is to kind of put you out there and let people know that they're, you're, you, you know, you're the, the, the executive who's kind of leading and looking after farmers, hemp farmers, prospective hemp farmers, people who are already in the game, everything around it. Like, uh, uh, you're, it's brilliant to have a leader like you, you know. And so, you know, thank you so much. We've gone way over time, but I'm we really. Certainly <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yeah. And look, and I'm really, but I'm just very, very grateful because you're too enlightening. It's very difficult not to keep, not to keep listening to you. And well, I really, yeah. And look, we we'll leave it at that. Chris, thank you so much. And uh, so uh, we we'll talk to you soon. I'm going to talk to you offline now, I guess. And then, you're welcome. Thank you, Stephen. It's been that. an absolute pleasure. Um, so I hope I made sense. <laughs>